So thank you, Isabel, for that great introduction. And thank you, Bridget. And thank you, everybody on the TEDx committee. And of course, thank you all for being here. Uh, so I'm Michael Luongo. I'm a PhD student in the, the first slide is, well, I'm a, okay, PhD student and researcher and a journalist. I'm part of the Purdue School of Hospitality and Tourism Management. And I look at how places recover their tourism after conflict. And there's two aspects of that that I look at. So there's the actual recovery, which is one part of it. The second part, which is more curious and maybe a little bit more difficult, um, is how they can do that more quickly. And my research also looks at how perceptions fit into that. So I'm going to give you a talk looking into the terrarium after war, how places can recover their tourism after conflict. So the first thing I want to do is go back a little bit in time to some of my work as a journalist in these areas. So this is going back almost 20 years, and I'm going to look at some quotes that might surprise you from people who've been to these locations. What is it about Afghanistan, she says, it's the people. I'm so in awe of their ability to recover after 23 years of war and oppression. It's an interview I did with somebody for Filmmaker Magazine. Here's another one. In spite of years of war, hospitality remains the Afghan people's core trait, and even the poorest refugees will offer everything they have to a guest. There's no place else I can go to that can give me that. That was an interview I did with somebody for the New York Times. So those might be surprising quotes, uh, knowing what we know of Afghanistan through the lens of war. We're going to go a little bit more forward in time to look at some of the work that I've been doing here at Purdue. Every day was a day of wonder. Let that quote sink into your head. Every day was a day of wonder. When he said that in the interview, I broke into a smile. I will say, in terms of the people, my expectation and reality were matched because I'd heard how warm and welcoming and hospitable everybody was, and they are. And that was an interview I did with somebody who'd recently been to Iraq at the end of last year. So we know that words are important, but we also know that phrase, that pictures are worth a thousand words. So let's take a look at some images from, from these locations. So that first image, when I show that to people, there's usually a bridge on the west coast of this country that comes to mind, if you can think about what that bridge might be. But it's actually the 14th of July bridge overlooking the Tigris in Baghdad. That other image right next to it, that's of Shahrazad from 1001 Nights or 1000 Arabian Nights. So it's a statue of her, and just like me, she talks with her hands a lot as she tells stories. Um, and that other image that's below it, that's in Kurdistan, which is beginning to emerge as a tourism destination within the Middle East. And it's an area where people can go hiking, kayaking, do all kinds of natural things. These are some images from Afghanistan. Now, that very first image of that van, and this is on the outskirts of Kabul, that for me brings up that every day was a day of wonder kind of notion. If you look closely at the van, enjoy the love is misspelled. So those are those little delights as a place is reconnecting itself to the world that you come across. That other image that's right next to it, that might be somewhat more familiar to you from the news. That's in Bamiyan in the north of Afghanistan. And despite the Buddha's not being there and what had happened there, when I visited, it was really peaceful, serene, and tranquil. It was not exactly as I expected, so even my own expectations and perceptions were changed. That other image that's below, that gets at one of the themes that we'll also talk about through today, resilience. So if you look closely, that's the bottom part of a missile or a bomb that has been repurposed into a flower pot. And that really gets us into our theme of terrariums and sort of containment of plants. And it's my belief that war zones, conflict zones, are very much like a terrarium. It's very difficult to go into them. It's very difficult for the people that are in them to leave. Um, we can kind of see what's going on through the glass. We know this from Ukraine, a war that's been going on about a year now. We can see through, people can project stories from Alp, through YouTube, Twitter, what have you. We kind of know what's going on, but there's this barrier that we can't cross. Sometimes what happens with that terrarium effect is what happened in Rwanda. So in the 1990s, Rwanda had this horrific civil war. And I never want to downplay the horrors that these places have gone through and the resilience it takes to recover. Roughly a million people were killed in Rwanda's civil war in the 1990s. But the interesting thing that happened is, because of the war and the perceptions after the war, there were many no-go areas and a lack of development. And what that means is that in some areas, nature was preserved, in particular, 
Um, some areas, the gorillas were preserved. And now, one of the best places in all of the world to see gorillas is Rwanda. And as it begins to emerge on the tourism radar, where people are planning trips, thinking about going, gorillas are a major part of that. The dates and time periods that I've given you, though, give an indication of another one of the themes through today. It can take 20 years or more, an entire generation, for a place to begin to emerge on the radar. So we see this in Rwanda, we see this also with Bosnia, which had a civil war at that same time. So we're at Purdue, you're all young people, probably 20 is about the average age that's here. So if you can imagine that from the time you're born till the time you graduate, that's how long it takes for a place to just emerge on the tourism radar after a conflict. So my work looks at how do you rebuild tourism after war, and how do you do so more quickly, and in particular, where do perceptions play into that? The other question is why tourism? So I'm part of the tourism school. Clearly, tourism is important to me. I will tell you, though, that my whole life, as both a journalist and a researcher, everyone told me the work I did was frivolous, you go to beaches, you go to pools, this isn't real work. However, what happened over the past three years? COVID. And tourism was taken away from each and every one of us. We couldn't travel, we couldn't see other cultures, other countries, we couldn't sometimes go to another state for three years. Now, this feels like a long time, and it certainly is. But for conflict zones, that sense of isolation and inability to travel and movement can last for decades. And very often, perceptions are part of that. The other part of tourism that's important to remember is that it's one of the world's largest economic sectors. There's this debate, is oil the largest? Is travel the largest? They're both roughly the same size. No one ever doesn't take the oil industry seriously, but travel has that issue. Until, of course, COVID, when it was taken away, and we realized how important it was. COVID until the pandemic represented one in four of all new jobs created in the world. 10.3% of all jobs, 333 million. To put that number into perspective, that's roughly the population of the United States, and 10.3% of global GDP. So we know that it can be a kickstarter for economies. We know what happens when you take it away, and my work looks at how, what happens when you focus it on places that are coming out of war, these very fragile economies. The other thing that makes tourism very different from any other economic sector is its ability to be a connector. So we know it connects people, countries, cultures. You go to a place, you tell your friends about it, they, they decide to visit, and so on and so on. So it's this connector that is very, very different. The other part of it that you may ask yourself is, okay, I get all that, but why conflict zones? Where did that come into the picture for you? So I'm from New York. And I have to say that I very viscerally understood in the aftermath of September 11th what it was like to be in a conflict zone and experience that. I had the experience actually of going into Ground Zero itself and digging for fellow New Yorkers. Um, I had that experience on Saturday, September 15th of 2001. My then brother-in-law was a police officer, so I went in with him as a, volunteer, a civilian volunteer. This image is at the World Financial Center. If you're familiar with the geography of New York, that's just to the side of where the Twin Towers were, and the Ground Zero Command Center was there. So that's where I'd reported to be part of a bucket brigade to, to dig through the rubble. So when I kind of look back at this image of myself also, in some ways I was a personification of the American flag as I was there. So I'm in blue jeans because you would wear blue jeans doing difficult work. I'm wearing a red shirt, and I'm wearing that for two reasons. One, my brother-in-law had explained that if I fell into the rubble, they needed to be able to find me very quickly and pull me out. The second part of it, if you look at the people behind me, they're wearing dark blue. So the actual first responders, the fire department, the police department, most of them were in dark blue, so this distinguished me as a civilian volunteer in there. When I went to the command center, they gave me a white helmet. And then I made my way through a sort of basement entrance in the World Financial Center to go into Ground Zero itself, right into the heart of Ground Zero. To say that it is overwhelming is an understatement. Um, it is very hard to grasp what I suddenly was standing in as I, as I exited that tunnel, that dark tunnel, into bright daylight and into what you're seeing here. But a few things that I will tell you to kind of put it into perspective for you. The Twin Towers were two 110-story buildings. When they collapsed, they collapsed into a debris field, what we know of as ground zero, for acres and acres, that was roughly 10 stories high, about as far as the eye can see when you're standing there. We're at Purdue, and I think 10 stories is probably about the tallest building that we have on campus. So if you can imagine a debris field suddenly standing in that, 
that's as high as the tallest buildings that we have on campus. That's what I suddenly was in. As I'm there, a few things begin to gel in my head. For one, as I'm looking at these piles, I think of ant hills in a hellscape that Hieronymus Bosch might have painted, for example. Um, but then I also began to think, almost in a way of solidarity, of places that experience this. The things we see, for example, in Ukraine as people are pulling people out of rubble. Beirut and their civil war came to my mind. Um, and then, really, I had a light bulb moment, uh, it, you know, while I was standing there in the rubble. Again, I'll go back to that idea of being a travel journalist and a travel researcher that everybody thought was frivolous, but I knew that it was not frivolous. Um, and what do I do? I go to places and I interview people, I photograph places, I bring that information back to people, uh, write articles about them, convince them to go to those places. So standing in the rubble of the Twin Towers, I swore to myself that what I was going to do was go to the places that we would find ourselves in conflict with, and I would write about them through the lens of culture and travel and other perspectives so that there'd be some other way to also look at these places. And the, th the thing that is really striking is that this was very different from the work that I had done up until that point. So for example, I was in Tahiti, um, and one of the most glamorous places in all the world where you just by chance run into movie stars, and I ran into Pierce Brosnan, James Bond, at one of the luxury resorts, and then that's April, and then five months later I'm maybe beginning a James Bond experience of my own. And then when, what would happen is I would wind up writing on Bora Bora within the space of just a few years, uh, a place in Tahiti that we know as a glamorous destination that everybody wants to honeymoon in, to writing on Tora Bora, a place that we know through the lens of war. A bit of time has passed, and some of you are younger. So Tora Bora, to remind you, it's, between, it's an area on the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan, and it's where bin Laden's caves were. And so I was actually sent there, I was writing some stuff for Bloomberg on some travel initiatives that, that were in that region. And if all you know of it is through the lens of war, and you see an image like that, of fields, of flowers, and mountains behind them, this vastly changes your perception. And actually, it was one of the most striking and beautiful places I'd ever visited. And so, the other thing that I want to point out, and this is one of the themes within this, um, in terms of the idea that, that we want to talk about, 20 years on, and 20 years on from 9-11 and the beginning of this work, war remains a constant. The Ukraine war is only the most recent example. I'll see more wars before I'm off the face of this earth. You young people will see even more wars. But despite that, despite wars being a constant, there is almost no research on how places recover their tourism sector after war, almost none. So that's the goal of my work here at Purdue, um, and has been my, my work also as a journalist. So how do you change that? How do you help these places recover after war? How do you look at that as a sector? How do you reconnect them more quickly? My belief is that you can do that through understanding tourist motivation, by interviewing people who've gone to these places, for want of a better word, pioneering journalists, uh, pioneering um, travelers who've gone there, um, and interviewing them, getting their opinion, their perceptions, understanding their day of wonder moments that they might be having there in places like Iraq, Rwanda, Afghanistan, and other locations, and then writing about that. And then if we can understand the people who are going there first, then those places can better understand who's going there and do a better job marketing themselves and do a better job connecting to themselves and restabilize their economies as they connect to the rest of the world. And if we can do that, if we can do that, it's my belief that we can improve the resilience of these locations. Um, we've already talked about how, they, how much they are going through. They're already very resilient, and we can improve that resilience. We can hear their own narratives. So rather than just what we read about them, we can visit and we can hear directly what people are saying about, about their locations. We know we can expand their economies because we know that's important and we know how important the tourism sector is for the world's economy. But most importantly, because of what makes tourism really, really different, is that we can reconnect these places to the world. And in my opinion, what I think, and with this work that I'm doing at, at Purdue and before, is we can smash open that terrarium. So we can smash open the glass so it's not just this barrier that we see between ourselves where we look in, the people look out, but we can't communicate, we can't really go in and out. And then the world can be reconnected to these places, and it won't take 20 years or more. And I have just one final slide, which is really a question for all of you and your own travels. So have any of you been to conflict zones? And if you have been, what was that like? What was that experience like? What did you tell other people? 
And if you haven't been, what might make you go? What might make you have one of those every day is a day of wonder moments when you're there that you go back and you tell your friends? So I'm Michael Luongo. I'm part of Purdue School of Hospitality and Tourism Management. Thank you for being here for my TEDx talk. Thank you.